Good morning. Welcome to this worship service of Ada First United Methodist Church. My name is Reverend Brandy Rigsby, and it is a joy to be gathered this morning with each and every one of you as we prepare to worship our risen Lord and Savior. I want to thank you for being here this morning. I want to welcome you, especially if you're visiting with us, if you're joining us online. It is great to be together, whether in person or through the gift of technology. If you are joining us online, Amanda is in the back today, keeping track of those live streams. So check in, let us know you're here, say good morning to one another. Of course, if you have any questions, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. A few announcements and reminders as we get started. Our United Women in Faith are continuing their annual seed collection. So that basket is still down on the front porch. If you would like to drop off some packets of vegetable seeds, um, those will be donated to the ministry down in Southern Ohio and we appreciate your contributions to that. Also today, right after worship, Sarah Gracie will be um, over in the room across the hall, room 205, working on the birthday and anniversary cards for our card ministry. So if you are able to stick around after worship for a few moments and help her fill out those cards, those are greatly appreciated by those who will be receiving them in the coming month to wish them a happy anniversary and a happy birthday. Also, Vacation Bible School dates to mark your calendar. Our Vacation Bible School Mission to Mars will be taking place July 15th through 19th. Um, registration link will be up soon. And right today we have a clipboard coming around. If you are interested in volunteering with VBS, please sign that clipboard, give us your information. And if there's a specific way you might want to volunteer, let us know. And then in the coming weeks, we'll be making phone calls to recruit those volunteers. It's a wonderful opportunity, a great time to see the kids here singing, having fun, worshiping, and knowing that they are loved in this time and in this place. Also, our summer music will be a beginning just around the corner. Our choir um, will sing through the end of May, and then beginning Sunday, June 2nd, we'll be looking for those with musical talent to share with us during our special music time. So if you are interested in performing during the special music time this summer, please let me or Scott Henning know, and we greatly appreciate that. Speaking of Scott, he is not here with us today. He's in Chicago with the high school choir, and the choir and Kim have taken the week off, so I want to say thank you to Julie and Amy and Josie for providing our music this morning. Our altar flowers today have been given by Bill and Phyllis Griffith in celebration of their family's April birthdays, Doug, Bill, Tessa, and their 61st wedding anniversary, which is today. Happy anniversary. And as I mentioned last week, we are coming upon our general conference, a meeting of the, the United Methodist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, beginning this week on April 23rd and running through May 3rd. Delegates from around the world will be gathering in North Carolina to vote on issues pertaining to our denomination. So there is a fly or an insert or a flyer on that music stand where you picked up your bulletins with some more information about what takes place at General Conference, a prayer um, to, be, to be holding during this week to come. But I'd like to invite us all to be praying for those who are there in leadership, those who are there as delegates, and for our denomination as a whole. Now, friends, as we move into this time of worship, May we enter with open hearts. May we come laying aside the distractions and the burdens that we carry so that we may be fully present in this time. May we know that God's spirit is already at work. And may you join me in worshiping our Lord and Savior today.
Thank you, Julie. Good morning. Please rise as you are able and join in our call to worship as is found in your worship sheet or on the screens. Brothers and sisters, if you lift your net and it is empty, come here. We'll cast it out again into Christ's abundance. If you open your eyes but do not recognize the Holy One, come here. We'll find the risen Christ here among us. If your life is full of mourning, come here. Christ is leading a dance of joy. Come here, sisters and brothers, to give blessing and honor and glory to God. Please remain standing to sing hymn 173 in the United Methodist Hymnal or on the screens. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading is Psalm 130, found in your pew Bible, page 428, or on the screens. I exalt you, Lord. You pulled me up. You didn't let my enemies celebrate over me. Lord, my God, I cried out to you for help and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from the grave, brought me back to life from among those going down to the pit. You who are faithful to the Lord, sing praises to him. Give thanks to his holy name. His anger lasts only for a second, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay all night, but by the morning, joy. When I was comfortable, I said, I will never stumble. Because it pleased you, Lord, you made me a strong mountain. But then you hid your presence. I was terrified. I cried out to you, Lord. I begged my Lord for mercy. What is it to be gained by my spilled blood, by my going down to the pit? Does the dust thank you? Does it proclaim your faithfulness? Lord, listen and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You changed my mourning into dancing. You took off my funeral clothes and, de- and dressed me up for joy so that my whole being might sing praises to you and never stop. Lord, my God, 
I will give thanks to you forever. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I gave you all a hard time on Easter and Holy Humor Sunday for bunching up in those back rows, nearly sitting on each other's laps. Well, I just found out you are perfectly split this morning on each side of the sanctuary. Well done. <laughs> now at this time, I'd like to invite our children forward for our children's message. Thank you for coming. Hey, how are you all? Everybody doing good? What? You're four? You're getting so big. And you're five? No, I'm four. Yeah. How many days of school are left? Does anybody know? 24, 24. <laughs> and the teachers in the room, how many days of school are left? <laughs> well, good morning, boys and girls. Yeah, you know what? I brought some things with me that you might use during summer break. I used these things last week. Let's see, Harper, can you get, get a couple of these out? Not the net yet. Get, hold that for me. And then we have this. What do you think we do with these things? What did I do with these? Go fishing, absolutely. So last week, I went fishing, and I caught some fish. Do you think I brought enough for all of you? Oh, don't worry, I brought fish for all of you. Look at this. Oh, look at that. Harper, can you help pass out those fish I caught for you? Did I catch those? Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> so as we start passing those out, I'm gonna tell you about the Bible story that we're gonna hear today in church. It's about the disciples after Jesus' resurrection. You see, they had been following Jesus around for years. And now that he wasn't with them, they weren't sure what to do next. So do you know what they did? What were the disciples doing before they met Jesus? Does anybody know? Ada, what were they, who were the disciples before they were with Jesus? What did they do as jobs? Fish. They went fishing. They were fishermen. Okay. Let's save these till... Um, after church, okay? Hold on to them for me. They were fishermen. So on this day, when the, Jesus wasn't there with them in person, they didn't know what to do. Guess what they did? They went fishing. They went fishing again. They went fishing all night. And do you know how many fish they caught after being out on their boat all night long? Zero. None. They didn't catch any fish. But somebody, there was a man that appeared on the shore, and he told them, throw your net over the other side of the boat. And they did it. Then do you know how many fish they caught? A bunch. A bunch. What fish? You're close, Cooper. 200. 153 fish. 
And when they pulled up those 153 fish, they knew who that man on the beach was. They knew it had to be Jesus, absolutely. And Peter, one of his disciples, he was so excited that it was Jesus, he jumped in the water and swam to the shore. The others rowed the boat in, and they gathered with Jesus, and they cooked the fish that they had caught. Now, if you think back, right before Jesus was arrested and crucified, Peter was asked three times by different people if he knew who Jesus was. And do you know what Peter did? He said no. He said no. He said, I don't know who he is. He's not my friend. I've never heard of this guy before. Why do you think he did that? Yeah, he was scared, right? He was scared for his own life. And so this day, as Peter was on the beach eating those fish with Jesus, Jesus came to him and he gave Peter a second chance. He said to him, he said, Simon, do you love me? And what do you think Peter said? Yes. yes. He goes, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Three times he asked him that question. Three times, just like the number of times Peter had denied Jesus. He asked him over and over again, Peter, do you love me? And when Peter would say yes, then Jesus would say, then go feed my sheep. Go feed my lambs. So I want you to think about it like this here for a moment. Uh, Lily, I'm going to ask you to do a math problem. You think you can handle this? All right, you ready? I need you to tell me the answer to 2 plus 3. How do you know? You just know? Look at what Cooper did. Cooper just showed me his work. You prove to me that you know what three plus two is, don't you? Show us again. Yes. Do your teachers ever say to you, Lily, you got to show your work? Yeah. All the time, right? So when Jesus was saying to Peter, if you love me, go feed my lambs, do you think he really wanted Peter to go feed sheep? No. What was he saying? Yeah, take care of his people. He was saying, if you really love me, I want you to show it. I want you to prove it by the work that you do. I want you to take care of my people. So this week, I have a challenge for all of you. I want you to find at least one way that you can show God's love to someone else, that you can prove God's love to someone. What are some ways you might be able to do that? Claire? Yes. Holding a door for someone, very good. Cooper? Your words, kind words, absolutely. Any other ways that we can show God's love, we can prove God's love? Sharing stuffies, absolutely. Those are great ideas, and that's our challenge for this week, okay? All right, let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us second chances, even when we make mistakes. Help us this week to show our love, to show your love, by showing love to others. Amen. All right, thank you. Our second scripture reading is John 21, 1 through 19, in the Pew Bible, page 829, and on the screens. Later, Jesus himself appeared to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, Zebedee's sons and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. They said, we'll go with you. They set out in a boat, but throughout the night, they caught nothing. 
Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't recognize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. He said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they did. And there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, he, that it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself for he was naked and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from the shore, only about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you, that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Doris. Well, here we are, just three weeks after Easter. When I say that, part of my brain says, three weeks, how can it only be three weeks? And then the other part of my brain says, wait, how has it been three weeks already? I think maybe it's something about this time of year. You see, spring always has a way of hitting us like a freight train, doesn't it? In my life, in my house, like many of yours, every night of the week, we either have soccer practice or a soccer game. And then there's piano lessons and track practice and dentist appointments and the lawn needs mowed. And my kids have begun their daily boycotts of getting up for school. We no longer know which basket of laundry is clean and which is dirty. We just sniff it. You still want sermons every week. My kids still want dinner every night. It's always this time of year that I begin to seriously consider, like Peter, throwing my hands up and saying, that's it. 
I'm going fishing. Now, believe it or not, I actually did go fishing last weekend. Here's proof. I brought photographic evidence. This is the fish I caught with my toddler-sized Lightning McQueen fishing pole and my hot dog bait. But it doesn't have to be fishing. It could be anything, really. We say, I've got to go for a walk. I need an ice cream cone. I just have to get out of here. Anything to get away from the fear, the chaos, from the overwhelming uncertainty. So in a very real way, I know why Peter walked out the door that day and grabbed his fishing gear. In the last few weeks, so much has happened. And for him standing there, it was all just too overwhelming. It was too much to take in. So he turned back to what he knew better than anything else. Something comfortable, something safe. Peter went fishing. Psychologists say that we as humans need two things in order to live happy and productive lives. We need a sense of belonging, and we need a sense of purpose. For three years, Jesus gave those things to Peter and the other disciples. They had walked beside him. They belonged to one another, and their purpose was crystal clear. But here and now, on this side of the resurrection, the joy and the awe of it all wearing off, Jesus no longer constantly by their side, leading them to their next mission. In this moment, Peter found himself lost. Wondering what was next. And oh, do I feel that. I know you feel it too. It's that time of year when we just set our sights on some sort of imaginary finish line. And we just keep saying, I just have to make it to tomorrow, next week, next month. <coughs> But then what? What comes after that hypothetical day and time? What comes after the to-do lists and the deadlines? Whatever finish line we have in mind, then what? For three years, Peter had been following Jesus side by side, listening to him teach and preach witnessing miracles, sitting in his presence. But now on this side of the resurrection, aren't we left with the same burning question that Peter had on his mind? Now what? What's next? You see, we believed our lives and our world would be flipped upside down. But here we are today. It all still feels pretty ordinary, maybe even underwhelming. A little bit like we're fishing in the dark and hoping more than anything just to take our minds off the disappointment that life isn't really any different than it was before the resurrection. And it seems that somewhere along the line, someone suspected that we would need more. You see, scholars argue back and forth whether this chapter of John is original to the rest of the gospel or if it was actually added later in time. Because in some ways, it just doesn't fit with the rest of John's gospel. It's like the reading from Mark's gospel that we heard on Easter morning in the original text, it says the women run away from the tomb empty and tell no one. The end. But someone decided that was a really stinky ending, and so they added a nice, neat, happy ending for us. Well, some scholars argue that the same happened in this chapter of John's gospel. 
Listen to how the chapter before, chapter 20, ends. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. That sounds like the end of a story, right? But then you turn the page and you find chapter 21, and here Jesus shows up unexpectedly again. But when he shows up this time, It wasn't to shake up the whole world or to turn the powers on their head. This time, he shows up on a beach, frying fish and cooking bread. No miracles, no shocking parables, just a simple question. Did you catch anything? Did you catch anything? For centuries, Biblical scholars and pastors have been trying to decode the great mystery of this passage. 153 fish. Pretty specific to mention, right? Well, there are all sorts of theories out there about the specificity of this number. One of them, Augustine argued that it was a symbol of the Ten Commandments and the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. For those who are not math people, 10 and 7 makes 17. I made it that far. But then the next part, if you add each of those integers from 1 to 17, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, all the way up to 17, what do you get? I gave you the answer. 153. It's a symbol of completeness but also a symbol of both the law and the gospel. Now, I cannot prove or disprove any of those theories, especially the ones with numbers. But, as Reverend Scott Hosey writes, he said, all theories aside, I'm quite content with Jesus on the beach. Jesus tending a fire, sizzling some perch, and saying to his friends, come, have some breakfast. That's the Jesus I need. That's the Jesus we need, isn't it? We need a Jesus who shows up in the nitty-gritty, ordinary moments of life. Reverend Hosey continues, We don't need only a stained glass window, Jesus, who speaks words only meant for the holiest and most sacred of events and occasions. He goes on to then quote Teresa of Avila and says, We need a Jesus in the kitchen, amid the pots and pans. We need Jesus on the beach and at the office. We need Jesus in the car and at school. We need a Savior who accompanies us on our everyday journey, who sees us in the ordinary, everyday circumstances of life, and who speaks to us in those moments, too. But even in the mundane task of fishing, throwing the net out, bringing it back in, Again and again and again, Jesus found a way to interrupt the monotony and the failure they were experiencing. Hey, have you caught anything? It's really more of a statement than a question. And then he says to them, throw your net over the other side of the boat. And I can't help but hear in those words, if your way isn't working, why don't you try mine? And notice all this is happening just as the sun is coming up over the horizon. A dark night of failed fishing has given way to the dawn of a new day with new possibilities and hope. And maybe this isn't just about the rising of the sun, S-U-N. 
but the rising of the S-O-N, the rising of the sun into the very darkness of our lives. Friends, whatever darkness you are walking through right now, remember Jesus was already standing there on the beach. He was already waiting for them in the darkness. They didn't recognize him at first. It's always hard to see hope in the middle of darkness. But when they did, when they heard his voice and recognized him, darkness gave way to light and their net was filled to overflowing. Upon recognizing him, Peter's eyes and heart, they were open. He was overcome with joy and he jumped into the water. I love that it points out they were only 100 yards away. They probably pulled the boat up on shore just as he made it to shore, but he couldn't contain himself. And soon they were all gathered around the fire, sharing a meal together again. And then just after they finished eating, Jesus turned to Peter with those three piercing questions. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Notice what Jesus called him. He calls him Simon. That's his old name. That's the man he was before he met Jesus. I'm sure that triggered that memory for him about what had happened. That day he denied Jesus three times. Maybe that's why he went fishing in the first place, racked with guilt. He didn't know his place or his purpose any longer. So he went back to the life he knew the life he knew before Jesus. He went fishing. So here and now, Jesus calls him by that name that he had before, Simon, do you love me? Three times, Jesus calls him by that name and questions him, Simon, do you love me? One for each of his denials. As Reverend Mike Marsh explains, Peter needed to understand that he was not bound to or identified by his past any longer. He was not bound to or identified by his past any longer. How many of us need to hear that? Listen again, you are not bound or identified by your past any longer. And with each of those earnest and repentant replies, Jesus not only forgives Peter, he restores his sense of belonging and his sense of purpose. If you love me, feed my lambs. If you love me, take care of my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. Maybe you need to hear the same question today. Do you love him? And if you, like Peter, can say yes, yes, Lord, you know I do, then keep listening. Keep listening for his voice in your life. Keep listening as he calls you to what's next. As he calls you not only to repentance, but also to action. With each question and answer, Jesus drew Peter from his past and freed him to become who he was meant to become on this side of the resurrection. So let me ask again, do you love him? Then feed his lambs. Do you love him? Then take care of his sheep. Do you love him? then feed his sheep. You see, Jesus' resurrection changed and continues to change everything. You do not have to be who you were before. Jesus has been raised from the dead and is calling you 
You do not have to live with guilt and shame any longer. Jesus has been raised from the dead and is calling you. You do not have to hide behind the safety and comfort of your old life. Jesus has been raised from the dead and is calling you. We don't have to fear death or darkness any longer. Jesus is alive and still calling our names. Here and now, the Spirit of God is moving and working and still bringing light and hope and resurrection into our lives and into this world. If only we will have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive. Will you join me in prayer? Ever-present Lord, just as you called Peter to cast his net into the depths once more, you call us. You call us to set aside our doubts and fears and to trust in your plans. And in those moments of uncertainty, when we feel lost and unsure of the path ahead, remind us of your unwavering presence and promise to never leave our side. Like Peter, help us today to hear your voice above the noise of the world. Guide us towards the abundant life that you have prepared for us. Grant us courage to step out in faith, to strip off the old things of our lives, the guilt, the shame, and the fear, and help us commit ourselves once more to live into the hope of your resurrection and your promised salvation. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Thank you, Josie. Now, as we prepare this morning to receive our tithes and offerings, may we know that Christ has called upon each and every one of us as the church here and now to be his hands and feet in this world. So may these gifts, may all that we say and do be for the building of God's kingdom. I invite you, will you please rise as you are able as we join together in singing the words of our doxology, Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
seated. Now as we enter into a time of prayer, may we come with open hearts. May we come lifting our prayers to God, but also listening. Listening for God's guidance, for God's voice to speak into our lives. Will you join me in an attitude of prayer? Lord God, You are our God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Your majesty and your glory surround us, and we have come today to celebrate your presence, to sing praise and to rejoice in your mercy and goodness. And we come as we are broken and healed, broken and healed, broken and healed. And so we pray that you will breathe on us, draw us near, open our hearts to the work of your Spirit. And when we turn back to the comfortable and the known, to the safe, Rather than seeking your will and your way, forgive us, O Lord. Call our names once more and speak courage into our lives. When we turn away and deny your presence in our lives, forgive us, O Lord. Call our names once more and speak redemption into our lives. When we fail to notice the small resurrections all around us, forgive us, O Lord. Call our names once more and astound us with your grace and love. Remind us again that you have forgiven our shortcomings, that you have sent deliverance to us through Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you merciful Lord. And now, forgiven and redeemed by your grace, we lift our prayers for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We lift up Ron Lynch's brother, Deacon Joseph Lynch and his family. As Joseph is in an induced coma following complications from surgery. Lord, in these days ahead, As difficult decisions are faced, we pray for strength. We pray for your peace. We pray that you will comfort his family and friends, and may he know in his heart that you are waiting. Lord, whatever your will in this situation, may we trust in your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up Nancy Allison as she recently injured her ankle and foot. Father God, we pray that your spirit of healing will be at work in her. May you give her patience and strength in the days ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up Scott and the high school music students who are traveling home from Chicago today. We pray that their time together was a blessing and for safe travels as they return. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We continue to lift up Linda Epley, Rob McCurdy, Nancy Fleming, Gary Clausen, and Elizabeth Kelly. 
And now, O Lord, in a moment of silence, we also lift up to you those whom we each carry on our hearts today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. As we go from this time and place today out into the world, we go as forgiven, reconciled, and redeemed people of God. And we pray, O oh God, that your spirit will fill us and turn our hearts again towards your presence. Give us eyes to notice the risen Christ among us. Give us ears to hear you calling our names and send us forth as Easter people to share the good news of resurrection and eternal life with all people. We pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus who taught us to pray by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, as Easter people, as people of resurrection, knowing that Christ's presence is among us today, may we lift our voices together with joy as we prepare to sing our final hymn. I invite you to rise as you are able. Hymn number 707, Hymn of Promise. May the grace of Christ, who calls us to cast our nets into the depths of faith, be with you always. May the peace of our risen Savior, who restores and reconciles, dwell deeply in your hearts. And may the Holy Spirit, who guides and empowers, lead you forth in love and in service. Go now in the assurance of Christ's abiding presence to live as resurrection people. Amen. Mm -hmm.